Welcome to episode 41 of the Selling Your Screenplay podcast. I'm Ashley Scott Myers, screenwriter and blogger over at SellingYourScreenplay.com. In this episode's main segment, I'm interviewing Alejandra Siri and Johnny T. Silver. They recently sold their first spec script and it eventually got produced. They go into some great detail about how they got this script sold. It was a lot of hard work, but they're very open about what they did, and anyone can do what they did, assuming they're willing to do the work. So stay tuned for that. If you find these these episodes valuable, please help me out by giving me a review in iTunes or leaving a comment on YouTube or retweeting the podcast on Twitter or liking it on Facebook. These social media shares really do help spread word about the podcast. A couple of quick notes. Any websites or links that I mentioned in the podcast can be found on the blog in my show notes. I also publish a transcript with every episode in case you'd rather read the show or look at something later on. You can find all the podcast show notes at www.sellingyourscreenplay.com slash podcasts. And then just look for episode number 41. If you want my free guide, How to Sell a Screenplay in Five Weeks, you can pick that up by going to sellingyourscreenplay.com slash guide. It's completely free. You just put in your email address, and I'll send you a new lesson once per week for five weeks along with a bunch of bonus lessons. I teach the whole process of how to sell your screenplay in that guide, how to write a professional logline and query letter, how to find agents, managers, and producers who are looking for material. It really is everything you need to know to sell your screenplay. Just go to sellingyourscreenplay.com slash guide. So now let's get into the main segment. Today I'm talking with writers Alejandra Siri and Johnny T. Silver. Here is the interview. Welcome, Johnny and Alejandra, to the Selling Your Screenplay podcast. I really appreciate you guys coming on the show today. All right. Thank you for having us. So to start out, I wonder if you guys can give us a quick overview of your career and, and kind of how you got to where you are today. Johnny, why don't you go ahead and, and start? Um, okay. Born and raised in Los Angeles. So I was sort of, uh, born into being a filmmaker, so to speak. Um, went to film school, did my undergrad at CSUN. I did some graduate studies at, uh, UCLA. I decided that I was spending more money on learning about films than making films. So I started by, uh, working at a couple of different companies. I worked in acquisitions. At the time, I worked in development. I worked in post-production. Just moving through the industry, trying to learn every aspect of filmmaking. Um, I winded up uh, at Final Draft, and at the time I was at Final Draft, I was uh, doing a lot of shooting and doing a lot of writing and uh, hooked up with Alejandro there. Um, when I left Final Draft, I started my own company, and we did a few productions. We started uh, producing uh, low-budget uh, features and uh, music videos and commercials, just anything that we can get our hands on. And in the midst of that, uh, my writing career really sort of took off. Uh, Alejandro, uh, Steve Scarlata, and I partnered up on creating a project called Final Girl, which was um, a shot starring Abigail Breslin and Wes Bentley. Um, so that, that project uh, went on from that project to start working with uh, David Milch on his television show for HBO. Um, worked with David for about a year, a little bit over a, a year, um, wrote a ton of scripts, wrote a ton of material, and then moved on to my own projects, just focusing on my own projects, um, marketing them, packaging them, attaching talent, just using all aspects that I learned in my early career to bring me to where I am now. Mm -hmm. That's in about 35 seconds. Yep, great, great. So, um, Alejandro, why don't you um, give us a quick overview of, of your career? Uh, sure. Uh, I, I did most of my undergrad at UCLA. I wasn't in the film department, though. So when I realized that I wanted to be a film director, uh, I basically left and started taking some film classes through UCLA Extension. Um, ended up with, a, you know, one of their certificate degrees in both entertainment marketing and in producing. So I did kind of like, I guess, a double major, double certificate there. Uh, got into writing because people said, if you want to direct, you need to write a fantastic low-budget script and, and, and hold on to it until they let you direct. So I started writing as a way to direct, funny enough. And, and here I am years later, certainly having uh, dire uh, written much more than I directed. I ended up ironically being hired to direct uh, my first feature film, uh, a small film called Placebo Effect. Uh, I did not write it, and, and it was just a hired gun. So, you know, I kind of did everything the way you're supposed to, but my career kind of unfolded backwards. Um, since then, I've written, I'm, I'm probably up to about 35 feature scripts by now. 
So I've, mm-hmm. I've done a, a ton of writing, did a few years as an entertainment marketing uh, copywriter, which landed me at Final Draft as the marketing director. Um, I'm now the uh, director of education there, so I deal with uh, gurus and teachers and film schools from around the world, and I travel the world to teach screenwriting and to teach Final Draft. So uh, that's sort of the day job while uh, still pursuing the screenwriting dream, which is very much alive and well um, for me. And uh, like Johnny said, uh, you know, the first project uh, that we sold was Final Girl, which uh, the two of us wrote with our other partner, Steven Scarlatta, who couldn't make it today because he's still doing some editing on a film he directed. But uh, that was a project that kind of put us on the map and, and gained us access to managers and agents and got us signed. And uh, that's where we are today. You know, we, we recently, not recently, over the last year, we've started to transition into TV writing especially after Johnny's stint with David Milch, you know, with a mentor like that, you'd be a fool not to go down that road. So we we're going down that road. We still write features, um, but we certainly do a lot of TV writing and we're both still uh, active directors looking to get uh, another feature directing uh, credit under both our belts, you know, over this next year or so. Mm-hmm. Perfect. So let's dig into Final Girl a little bit. I'm just, this is not really a, a script marketing question, but I've written a lot of scripts with other people. So I'm always curious how teams work. I've never been involved with a three person writing team. So that seems a little bit, um, you know, definitely more people, more egos, more, um, you know, potential, ro- you know, places where people might, there might be some friction. Um, so this was just a spec script. Maybe you can tell us sort of the logistics. How do you guys write together as a team of three? Does one person take some scenes and write them? The other people edit them? How does that all work and come together into one succinct, you know, voice that is that final script? Um, I think we had, we had a unique situation that landed us in uh, this menage a trois, <laughs> you know, and, 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 and following the rules of menage a trois is watch where you reach and grab. <laughs> uh, you know, we each, we each kept our distance and, and as far as ego goes, I mean, there were, there were no ego issues at all. I mean, this, the very short story of it was that originally it's something that Steve and I started writing. Johnny was going to produce it. I was going to direct it as my second feature film, and we were going to try to make it at a very, very, very low budget. By low, I'm talking under two hundred thousand. Mm-hmm. And um, I'll let kind of Johnny let tell the story of how we actually stole that script because there's a lot of lessons to be learned there. But essentially, at one point, you know, we went from okay, you guys are going to produce and direct to okay, we want to buy the script. We got a, a, an exciting director that's going to come on board and all this stuff is going to happen if you guys are willing to step down. And we did. And I didn't want to leave Johnny out in the cold. There was nothing on the table as far as money between us. So we invited him to join us as a writer. So he was still part of the project, still had his name on it. And, you know, he was already a screenwriter. He was serving as a producer initially, but he was already a screenwriter. Um, and he just joined the circus with us. I see. Okay. So yeah, Johnny, why don't you take us take us that next step and um, kind of tell us how you guys marketed this script and, and eventually sold it? Well, I mean, first and foremost, I mean, this is a collaborative art form. So I mean, you know, the, the notion that once you write something and put it on page, it's just going to stay that way. Nobody else will ever have a opinion or an idea, you know, that will improve that product is sort of a it's a farce, you know. Um, mm-hmm. And we went into creating Final Girl knowing that um, when when Steve and Alejandro brought Final Girl to me, you know, I saw a potential in it, and it serviced and marketed as the right place, right time. Um, it was something that we could make for the right budget. So we went about uh, creating the packaging and the marketing materials for Final Girl. But in looking through Final Girl, I had a lot of different ideas and suggestions, and I would give them, you know, I would bring them up to Alejandro and to Steve, and eventually we got to a point where they were like, hey, we'll just take a crack at it. Um, take a crack at it from both a writing perspective and then Alejandro and I worked on taking a crack at it from a marketing perspective. So as we were sort of creating the rewrite for for Final Girl, we were also creating the marketing materials, which is uh, we created a very thorough lookbook or or marketing book for it, but we also had a pretty uh, vivid uh, plan that included distribution, that included what the budget would or should be in A, B, and C uh, scenarios, 
and also uh, sort of did our due diligence knowing the type of places that it would go to, the type of places that would produce it, what they would be looking to make it for, who they would be looking to attach to it. Um, we went to a lot of different um, events and organizations and around town to friends that we knew, and we actually were showing them the marketing material before we even showed them the script. And mm-hmm. nine times out of nine, people were responding to the marketing material saying, hey, this is something that, you know, most screenwriters don't do. This is something that most, you know, filmmakers just fail to, to do. They always tell us about their story, and then they want to drop a script on us, and then they sit at home waiting for a big check to come. But you guys are showing us how the business of your project could actually work. Well, we went around to a lot of different really big managers at really big management companies who weren't our managers, who were our friends, who saw the potential of the material and they would make calls and, you know, move it around. Um, part of our regiment of, of just creating projects and vetting projects and getting some feedback since development no longer really exists in the stu- at the studio level unless you're a, an A-lister is to utilize a lot of screenwriting contests, a lot of producing contests for uh, – for festivals, things of that sort. So we were submitting another project that I produced, that I was attached as a producer that Alejandro wrote that we were going to do also in the same vein of Final Girl, but a different project, a a drama, to the Sundance uh, Producing Lab. And we got a call back from the Producing Lab from one of the, the producers at the Producing Lab who said, you know, I absolutely love your package. I absolutely love this project. I can tell you we're not going to break it into Sundance, but if there's anything else that you guys have, you know, I'm looking for contained thrillers, you know, or horrors. Do you have anything like that? Well, we have Final Girl, and at that point we had just finished the Final Girl rewrite, so submitted Final Girl. And this wasn't something that was just done, like, via email. I literally got a call in the middle of the night from the producer who had read the project right after I sent it, and said, I want this, I want to make this, I have some friends in town, let's get this going. Um, so there was a really big executive producer that had just left a uh, cushy position at a studio, and it's one of the studios that had made a lot of films that Alejandro Steven and I loved, who was sort of moving into the independent universe. And um, this was one of the projects that he wanted to do, so we did a short-form option with him. Um, and they started putting the wheels together to push Final Girl along. And at that point, Alejandro was still attached to direct. I was still attached as one of the producers. We all had writing credits because I did a few passes on Final uh, Girl, too. Um, and then from there, those guys, you know, the option sort of ran out. And when the option ran out, the producer who came from the Sundance Lab, he winded up at another company that had just won an Academy Award as the head of development. And he said, this is the first film that I want to make. I have a, a producer, I mean, I, I have a, a director attached. He has access to talent, and we also have investors looking at this project. So we did another uh, option, which eventually turned into a sale, which eventually wound up being packaged by an, an agency's uh, ICM. And from there, things just started rolling along. So mm-hmm. it was a mix of being at the right place at the right time, but also having the right marketing plan. Because essentially, mm-hmm. from the time that we created Final Girl to the time that we literally got the check for Final Girl, all the companies that we went to, all the people that we went to, were still using our original marketing and distribution plan and strategy. And even mm-hmm. to this day, the people refer back to it. It was it was so good that I, it was just weird because at one point they did ask us to participate as producers and said, look, we're going to use your strategy anyway. You guys might as well be producers. But to not muck up the deal they asked us to step down, which we were fine doing, you know, all in the name of the project. So, yeah, yeah. um, let's, let's, uh, let's back up a little bit. There's a bunch of, I mean, there's a lot of great lessons in that. So I'm just going to um, kind of try and dig into some of the things you said. First off, one thing that occurs to me, this, since this is a movie that's already been made and it's sale, I wonder if you guys would be willing to send me like the PDF of all these marketing materials and I could post them online for people to look at. Would you, is that something that you could share with, with the listeners of the podcast? uh, (laughs) Okay, so we would send you some of the marketing material, uh, and the reason why I wouldn't send, I, I couldn't send you all is because I actually have a side business where I create this marketing material for mm-hmm. filmmakers, um, and it's based off of sort of the lessons that we have learned and scaling down our approach to what works. 
So I'm more than happy to share with you and your listeners all that I can. And yeah, yeah, the, anything to... anything was is better than nothing. So yeah, because we'll have to we'll we'll talk about that um, after the after the interview, and I'll, I'll yeah. we'll get that arranged. A couple questions. What you said you created a lookbook. Let's just um, define for the audience what is a lookbook for a feature film. Okay, so if you're familiar with the marketing world, or if you're not familiar with the marketing world, all products before they go into the final phase of, of uh, mass production are usually put into a lookbook, which means it's a book, a magazine-style layout, which shows your product in association with the lifestyle that it would be. So say, for instance, if it were jeans, you would see a, a book full of beautiful people wearing jeans, riding horses, walking down the beach, yada, yada, yada. Mm-hmm. Well, this concept also applies to films. Um, a lot of the times we don't have the uh, means to create the assets to uh, essentially show our ideas. So sometimes you have to create things that are very similar that are in the vein of the idea. So a lookbook encompasses your idea or the world of your film, but it also should tell a story about your product. It should tell a story about you as a filmmaker. It should tell a story about your characters. It should tell, it should essentially be able to communicate to producers, to investors, to distributors, and to a lay person what your film will be, what it will feel like, what it will taste, what it tastes like, what it will look like. And if you're smart, you'll actually include business uh, information that will give investors an idea of what they can look to get back on their investment. So, mm-hmm. so do, you, uh, do, you, do you literally create images, you get actors, you get a still photographer, and you shoot like little snapshots from the movie, or do you grab it, images from other films it, it, that are similar what? in tone? Sometimes it takes a hybrid. Um, the only problem with, with hybrids, the only problem with grabbing images – and uh, from other films is you're setting yourself up to live by the expectation of those films. Like, you know, so if I'm creating a gangster film and I grab scenes from The Godfather, well, The Godfather is one of the most iconic uh, gangster films in the history of cinema. So everything less than The Godfather is just you're, you're, you're lying to your, your investors, you're lying to the producers. So at times we'll actually uh, create the images from scratch which is we'll use our own actors, our own setups, things like that. But at other times we'll grab films that are that are in the vein, but we'll put it on disclaimers and say, okay, these are in the vein. This is not, you know, what we've done. We don't have anybody on our, you know, crew that shot The Godfather, but this is the look that we're going after, or this is the mm-hmm. feel that we're going after. So it's sort of a mishmash. It depends on the project. With Final Girl, we used a lot of original imagery, um, and uh, we relied a lot on sort of my marketing experience, but a lot on Alejandro's marketing experience. As we said earlier, he worked for a uh, trailer company, um, mm-hmm. and I had cut trailers before, so we were sort of used to creating these very short-form uh, visual representations of what a film should look like or what the film should look like. Um, so we used that editing knowledge to create the lookbook. So to answer your question, sorry if I'm long-winded, but to answer your question, um, it just depends on what the project is. It depends on what assets you have available to you. It depends on who you're working with. Um, if you're trying to sell a horror film, for instance, you know, there's a lot of things that you can use that are in the news that are in the public domain because you're not selling your lookbook. This is just a marketing material. There are things that you can use that can sort of tell your story and give you the look and the style that you want without infringing on somebody else's franchise. Like what yeah, I take, yeah. I wouldn't take the image from Saul, but there's a lot of great photography, you know, in newspapers. There's a lot of things that you can use that are that will give you that that same visual representation. Yeah, yeah. So then let's define just a little bit what is and and I guess what you were saying, what you're ultimately getting to is you have like a distribution plan and a marketing plan, and you wrap that into the lookbook. Is that correct? Yeah. Yes, but but please make note that your lookbook is different than your business plan and your business strategy. Um, I'm of, and, and, you know, and I learned a lot of this from Alejandro and I learned a lot of this from working for marketing companies. I'm of the, the mindset that everything that we do should be visual and should um, express creativity and individuality and should, you know, have some artistic flair. 
So I tend to create a lot of different documents that are still very, you know, visually stimulating. Like, um, essentially, your business plan is going to lawyers and to uh, business managers and to bankers and to investors and people who only care about numbers, but they spend their entire lives looking at, you know, uh, black numbers on white pages or looking at computer screens. So mm-hmm. I tend to add a little bit more flair to the business plan, but your lookbook should just be essentially a visual telling of the style and the feel of your story. That's mm-hmm. what your lookbook should be. Your lookbook okay. is, a doc- is a document you should uh, be open to sharing with a lot of people, but your business plan you should share with nobody, only investors. I see. And then, okay, so what goes into like a distribution plan and, and this marketing plan that you guys came up with? Okay, so in the distribution plan – and the marketing plan, you have to have your business strategy. It's a business plan that's similar to business plans for starting up any other business, which talks about sort of what you need, what you want, and where it's going to go. Um, but in a distribution strategy, you have to essentially isolate who your audience is, how you're going to communicate your product to your audience, your film to your audience, your story to your audience, and how you're going to utilize a lot of the companies that would do business with your type of product to get them to do the same. So in our distribution plan, we essentially isolated the types of companies that would be distributing our film. We knew that we had a a thriller that was a female-driven thriller that had both a female protagonist and a female antagonist. It was dark. It was moving. It, it was shocking. There's no way that certain companies are going to sell this type of film. They're not in the business of doing that. That came from us doing research. So during that research, we looked at sort of what were the films that the companies that would distribute this type of film, what were they releasing? What were they releasing that year? What did they release the year before that? What were they were going to release the year after that? Sort of what were the books that they were acquiring? We looked at all this material, and we sort of curtailed our material to that material uh, just to give us a closer estimation of, of what the business would look like. So in our distribution plan, Instead of saying, you know, we're going to wind up going to Sundance and, you know, at Sundance we're going to have the highest acquisition in the history of Sundance. We're going to sell this movie for $10 million and it's going to make $100 million its opening weekend and we're all going to, you know, have Ferraris and Tyrannosaurus Rexes. We said, mm-hmm. okay, you know, Lionsgate is a type of company that would distribute this film. Um, you know, Magnet is a type of company that would distribute this film. And these are the acquisitions that they had this year, and this is about the level that we were going for. So this is what so the distribution strategy will be. It will be to attack these types of companies. Well, these are the places where those companies do business. So mm-hmm. in our distribution plan, we would say, okay, we, we definitely are going to be at the, the Cannes film market. We're definitely going to be at the AFM film market. We're definitely going to be at the Guadalajara film market. Um, and, and having that, it gave us more of an opportunity to do business with these people uh, as opposed to not doing business with these people. And it was mm-hmm. all in the book. Everything was yeah. in the book. Yeah. So the distribution plan, no, you don't approach any distributors at this point. It's just a document basically outlining what you're going to do once the film is finished, no, correct? No, uh, not really correct. And this is, and once again, I know your, your levels, uh, uh, your listeners are very professional. So I know some of them are producers. And some of them already have distribution relationships, you know. So I'm an advocate of getting all the information, doing all your due diligence before going out into the marketplace. I just don't like to have egg on my face. So if you have those relationships, you reach out to those relationships and you say, this is the film that I want to make. These are the type of, this is the type of places that I would like it to play. What would I need to do business with your company? What are the actors that I would need to do business with your company? You know, you get the information from the distribution companies if you can. If you don't have access to distribution companies, if you don't have access to individuals who have relationships, who have sold and actually fulfilled their obligations to distribution companies, then that's when you have to seek out partnerships. And those partnerships are the people that you have to attract. So those partners also have things that they require the type of material that they're looking for, the places that they do business. So in our in our package, we did a lot of our due diligence very, very early on. We did a lot of our research early on. We made the calls. We sent out the emails. 
We, you know, went to the marketplaces. We shook the hands. We kissed the babies. We sat mm-hmm. down with the distributors. So we had a very in-depth understanding of, you know, where our film would go, the worst case scenario, where our film would go, the best case scenario. And uh-huh. we sort of just could not, like, we curtail a lot of the things based on the market from the business side of it. We didn't want to mm-hmm. overshoot the market. Like, if we had a home run, that would be awesome, you know, but we don't we don't live for home runs we live for for base runs so yeah you got you got to play it very conservatively uh you know rather the first sign of an amateur amateur business plan is the guy that you know quotes paranormal activity or blair witch like you know that that is a once in a lifetime scenario lightning rarely strikes twice in that kind of way so we we don't play that game I now, you know, since the whole Final Girl thing, I, I've optioned uh, two scripts to a producer who was actually one of our mentors in one of these labs that we did, uh, of the several labs that we went through. And she has a background in, uh, you know, pre-sales and distribution. So she took my, my scripts. They were both low-budget thrillers. And she would take them to these big distribution companies, international companies, and say, please read this. That's where the relationship comes in. They would read it. And she would say, you tell me how much this movie's worth and who I need in it to sell it for how much and where. And then mm-hmm. she gets those numbers, and then you start to work backwards from that. And you work very conservatively. So, so you know, you have to be fiscally responsible. And, and you got to keep those numbers really low. And worst case scenario, you're going to meet expectations. Best case scenario, you might be that Blair Witch home run. But if not, no one's going to lose their, their butts on it. No. Mm-hmm. And I can tell you from experience, I've literally this this year looked at maybe a hundred business plans and ninety percent of them quote <laughs> Saw and Blair Witch and like it's just remarkable and a lot of these are created by, you know, lawyers who have who make a lot more money than I do and who, you know, do business plans for other types of businesses. But when mm-hmm. it comes to the movie industry, there's sort of this magic and this mystique that people wanna sell. It's, you know, without, for lack of a better word, a lot of people bullshit in their business plans, and I yeah, don't. Yeah. So I'm curious. I mean, I've been in the industry for years. I've certainly heard of Khan and AFM, but I've never heard of the Guadalajara film market. How did you guys even, like, get the background to know about that stuff? Asking people. <laughs> okay. <laughs> this, and and this, we happen this, to be, we both happen to be Latino filmmakers. We We, we don't specifically and only write Latino themed projects, whatever that means. But in the case of Final Girl, initially there was a, a Latina protagonist in it. So obviously that was a smart place to start to look. And we had gone through a few fellowships that were diversity fellowships where some of those relationships were tied into those worlds. So, you know, like like Johnny said, just finding out information and, and just really – looking at your project and, and thinking about what could this be? Could this be, you know, the hottest Latino thriller that comes out, you know, in, in the last few years, let's explore that world. Or is it just going to be a straight up thriller, you know, a white American uh, protagonist. And in that case, it's who do you need and what can it do? So mm-hmm. it's kind of just looking over under every rock and, and seeing what the potential is and being flexible because you know what? If the business dictates it, somebody's going to tell you to change something along the line. So if you can beat them to it and creatively weave it in organically so it doesn't feel like, well, you just changed that name just because, you know, it was an easy sale here or there. But to make it organic, it, it makes mm-hmm. all the world a difference. And, and as a writer with a producer hat on, I mean, that, that's a smart move, I think. Yeah. So you, in building this distribution plan, where can someone just do the research? Is IMDb Pro enough? I mean, no. where could someone research these companies? Once again, this is what I would suggest. And if you live in Los Angeles or you, if you live near California, I would suggest every year or at least one time go to the AFM market. It happens in November. Um, passes are a little bit expensive. Accommodations are a little bit expensive. But get to the market, walk around, walk around the market, walk around on the sales floor, talk to as many small distributors as you can, try to talk to as many big distributors as you can, introduce yourself, go and educate yourself on how and where films make money. Um, mm-hmm. The reason why IMDb Pro is in, 
enough. And the reason why, you know, other sites aren't enough, enough box office mojo, even if that's still around, you, you need somebody that actually has the experience of delivering a project to a distributor and has good relationships. Um, and if you don't have that, your goal should be to partner up with that individual. You mm-hmm. simply have to ask yourself, where do independent films or where do films make money at? And they make money in, in markets. So how do they make money? And by asking yourself that question, you'll start to uh, create a lot of answers for yourself. So you can do a lot of the, the research. You can have the information, but that doesn't necessarily make you capable of doing your own comps because – there's a lot of information that's not presented there. Like people know sort of what are the turkeys, what was just forced upon a company just to continue, just so another company can continue doing business with the company, but that they didn't mm-hmm. really like. And you can put that as one of your comps, and you've already ostracized a distribution partner or a potential distribution partner. Your goal should mm-hmm. be to attract bigger fish, and that's what we did with Final Girl. Like, were were Alejandro and I capable? of, you know, uh, shooting and delivering a great product to the marketplace? I believe so. But is it better for us to have attracted the bigger fish that we have and have him take it to a bigger company that he was working for and have the wheels get put on it that way? Absolutely. It moved fast. Everybody called it lightning in a bottle. So the goal should be to attract uh, people that have a lot more experience and uh, bigger contacts and access than you and to partner yeah. up with those people and to create packages that actually hold some weight. See, the term package mm-hmm. people throw throw around a lot, um, and it's just one of those Hollywood myths. People are like, well, what is packaging? What is packaging? Well, there are entire departments at agencies and management companies and production companies that deal with packaging, which essentially is creative partnerships and strategic partnerships that would move the needle further than going it alone. Mm -hmm. So we did the same thing with Final Girl. We just did it on a micro scale. Um, Mm -hmm. We sort of knew what we would need. We we put the tight dress on and the lipstick and the perfume and the high heels, and we knew what we were trying to attract. We knew what type of individual we needed to to help us uh, push Mm -hmm. on to the next level. So to answer your question, I would say that you can start by having the professional tools to allow yourself access to the information. Um, you can read the trades. You can get trades during uh, the markets, during the, the Cannes Film Festival, during the, Ber- the Berlin market, during the uh, American film market. You can get the, the trades at that time and sort of read and see, you know, what's being acquired, how it's being acquired, where the needles are moving at. Um, but to create the material for yourself, I would always say, first and foremost, try to seek a professional partnership. If you don't have access to a professional partnership, listen to blogs like this one. Um, get the information. Uh, listen to the people that are talking. Do your research. Try to reach out on, on Facebook. Try to reach out on Instagram. You know, the, the beautiful uh, thing about this world is that we're all sort of connected now. So the soft approach is at times more advantageous than just, hey, here, you know, be my partner, buy my script, let's make a movie, I'm great. Like, mm-hmm. that really doesn't work anymore. So mm-hmm. I, would, I would say uh, invest in the tools, but use them to attract a bigger, better fish. And hopefully mm-hmm. that fish can attract bigger, better people. Like I'll, I'll, give I, you, I'll give you the short answer to that, too. If, if you were diagnosed with a tumor, you're about to get divorced, you're not going to go and start studying law and medicine to cure yourself or help yourself. You're going to go to a professional. For the amount of money that, let's say, an East Coast screenwriter would spend to go to one of these conferences like Story Expo or Script Expo or whatever, for the amount of money you would spend to travel, stay in a, in a hotel, feed yourself, take a few people out to drink, et cetera, you could have spent that money paying somebody like Johnny to do this business plan for you. And, and like you said, use that to then get yourself to that next level. So. It's not a terrible amount of money. It's certainly way less than you would spend on that dream that you may have of shooting a trailer or a teaser for your project, and it would be money well spent. And, and you should spend it. You should be willing to invest. If this isn't a hobby, then you should be willing to invest some money to get it to the next level. Um, certainly, you want to educate yourself, get up to speed. 
using all those things that Johnny suggested. But you, you don't want to tackle this on your own because this is the most no. important part. I mean, we sold Final Girl because of our business plan. Regardless of how great or bad the script may have been, it was the business plan that got us in the room, and it was being in the room that got us the deal. So Yeah, yeah. No, that's an excellent point. I mean, worthwhile. That's an excellent point. For the amount of money that you're going to spend going to one of these so-called screenwriting conferences, you could just buy a plane ticket to Santa Monica and go to AFM in November. There you go. And, um, and then that's probably a better investment actually talking to real producers than talking to um, you know a bunch of gurus at a screenwriting conference. Um, let's move on. I just want to hit one other thing about Final Girl um, that you guys were talking about. It seems like um, the screenwriting labs, the Sundance Lab, those have opened some doors for you guys. And, and it's, it's always interesting to hear, too. It's not like you guys were just the the blockbuster winner of the of the Sundance Lab, but it was enough to kind of make some good contacts. Um, how many of these different screenwriting labs did you enter over the course of of your careers? And just I, I always ask these kinds of questions so that people understand the scope. It's not like you entered one contest, got no. a contact, and we're off to the races. People no. need to understand that it generally takes you know m- entering many of these things and getting rejected many times and not getting anything out of them to actually get to that one point where you do get something out of them. We've- we still enter them (laughs) to be 100 percent honest with you like we still enter them it's it's sort of part of our um it's part of our regiment and it's sort Mm -hmm. of an exercise for us we don't enter them thinking that you know we're going to win and that's going to be the golden ticket and that's going to take us to the next level we enter them because that process of entering of paying you know paying for your product and being rejected is it builds you up as a screenwriter and as a business person, but it also exposes other individuals to your product. So when people respond favorably to that product or, or to, you know, to that script or that treatment or whatever you're submitting, that's a, that's a, a positive for you. Um, one thing that Alejandro and I do is we sort of always make the rounds of these festivals, of these contests. Like we, we've limited them, limited them down to the ones that really do matter, the ones that matter to the upper echelon producers and agents and, and companies and things of that sort. But, you know, we make the rounds, and then after making the rounds, we have no expectations of those projects. Like, we sort of send them out and forget about them. And if anything comes back, that's yay for us. That's another feather in our hat. That's another mm-hmm. tool for us to mark ourselves. But it's very important to invest in yourself, like Alejandro said, to invest in your product. For every script that you write, like, if you're not going to create a business plan for yourself, you should plan on investing between 500 and $1,500 in just that process, in just sort of developing it on your own, uh, getting notes back from certain organizations or certain companies, things of that nature. Not that mm-hmm. they're going to, you know, make you write the best script ever, but that, that process of investing in your product and, and you know, getting feedback and, and, and taking that feedback in, it makes you grow as a just as a person. Um, mm. it, it's you taking your career seriously. It's you not yeah. being a hobbyist. It, I wonder yeah. if you guys could just. I wonder if you guys could just quickly list because I always get this question: What are the labs and the contests that you guys still enter that you think actually carry some weight within the industry? Maybe just quickly list them um, so that people can know which ones they might spend their money on. I could give you a few of those, and I could actually. I mean, you you were specifically asking numbers and times and and i I have a couple of really interesting notes about that that helped us and maybe will help others uh the sundance lab i had that same uh, project that we submitted to the producers lab i had submitted to the writers lab it made the semi-finals three years in a row three years in a row it almost got in but didn't get in but it took that one time where we just sidestepped it, went to the producer's lab and said, we still didn't get in, as Johnny said, but that's how we met the producer that ended up, the executive producer that ended up, uh, you know, being our cheerleader and got our film made. Um, Hmm. So you don't enter to win. You enter to get exposed. You enter to get feedback and to become better and know more people. Um, Hmm. One of the other programs that we've done a lot of stuff through is uh, NALIP, which is a Latino program. independent producers organization their conference draws quite an impressive number of executives from hollywood and we went through there with uh the producers lab the final girl went through their producers lab with johnny 
Um, that same drama from the Sundance Lab went through their Latino media market, and then Final Girl also went through their Latino media market, which is basically their pitch event. For, you know, it's very, very exclusive hand-picked pitch event, you know, for like 10 projects. But the one of the producing mentors in the producing lab ended up being the woman who optioned two of my scripts in this past year. So everything, I think every single deal, everything we've done, every serious meeting has in some way or other come out of these labs and fellowships. Mm-hmm. Um, I would, I I would say Sundance there is, you know, close to the top. And the Leap is a great one. Um, I went through a nasty television writing fellowship. Unfortunately, they lost their funding, so that's not around anymore. And I know Johnny went through the Cosby Fellowship, another very prestigious uh, program. Um, I would say if you had to, if you had to do four, or f- I would say aim at five. If you had to do five, uh, from a writing perspective, there's always the Nichols. Um, yep. There's the Sundance Writing Lab. There's uh, IFP's um, uh, independent. There's their screenwriting program, and then also their producing program. Um, you have Final Drafts uh, screenwriting contest, the, the, the big uh, script contest, and then Blue Cat would be the fifth one. So uh-huh. focusing, if you just have five, but I would also say if they're looking at doing more than five, look at the ones that give you maximum exposure, and that will put you in a place that you can sort of meet these producers that we're talking about. So there's mm-hmm. Austin, um, there's one associate, there's always a bunch of them associated with Toronto, the Toronto International Film Festival, um, Tell Your Ride. Um, usually all of the big film festivals have sort of a, screenplay or producing offshoot you just have to search the information and make sure you're dead on with the dates for television um the diversity labs every major network has a diversity lab so um for you know women and minorities that the diversity lab is there um for non-women and non-minorities like even placing in the nickels is almost a guarantee of you sort of getting the representation that you're seeking and it's a huge feather in that um, mm-hmm. so yeah, just look at the ones that give you maximum exposure and you'll see those contests. They're usually the ones that cost the most and they're the ones that are doing, are, that are doing the most marketing. Um, but if regional too, you know, sometimes being a big fish in a small pond is worth, you know, is, is worth a lot as well. So if you live in places like Kentucky or places like in Louisiana, Texas, Georgia, Michigan, you know, New York, any of the places, uh, New Mexico, any of the places that have um, a lot of uh, uh, tax incentives and that, you know, producers are coming to or companies are coming to the shoot, winning that regional screenplay or producing contest for that small uh, film festival will give you a talking point when those people do come to town and you're marketing yourself and you might meet them in a bar, you might meet them, you know, at a, at a hotel and say, yeah, I just won this festival here. And, and can spark up a conversation. Plus, mm-hmm. it looks good on your resume. So yeah, yeah. And, and I would yeah. also say feedback. You know, anyone who gives you coverage back and decent coverage, um, y- you will pay more for coverage than some of these contest costs to enter. And sometimes, <laughs> Johnny and I, we, we believe in a very fast development process. And the way we do that is we get a lot of feedback right away from a lot of trusted people, and we quickly mm-hmm. do our rewrites and get it ready for market. But, you know, one very affordable, if you don't have those kind of friends that are knowledgeable enough or willing to read for free, some of these contests will cost you less to enter and give you back feedback than it would cost you to just pay any old reader, you know, out of film school. So look into yeah. that. IFC's got some great feedback. I have gotten great coverage from them in the year, in the past few years. I think, Johnny, you have a few favorites when it comes to that, don't you? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Let's um. I I think we should have scheduled a two hour call because I think I mean I could I could talk to you guys for hours about this stuff. You guys just have a wealth of information. I really want to get into your current project because I think you guys are doing some again some really interesting things on the marketing front with that. So let's talk quickly talk about that. Um, talk about driven and, and kind of tell us what your your marketing plan looks like for that and how you're going about executing that. <laughs> it's funny that you said that because I literally have to deliver a look the lookbook for driven today. Mm-hmm. Um, Driven is a project that I wrote uh, after uh, my mentoring uh, from David Notes that's uh, based on a uh, Los Angeles-based limousine company and a limo driver that moonlights for the mob to pay off a debt. Um, so essentially, by day, he drives for the elite. 
by night he's doing he's a getaway driver for the mob and in the meantime he's trying to solve out a bunch of uh, solve a bunch of personal problems that he has between himself and his father his quarter life crisis etc 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 um one of the things that i did not want to do because television is sort of taking this new direction that's very similar to independent film but it's not it's a little bit more regiment is i didn't want to sit around and wait 10 years um, in a development pool with Driven. Um, my agent and my manager are going, we're currently going out with it, but what I wanted to do was apply some of these lessons that we have been talking about um, from the marketing perspective to Driven. So the first thing that I did is when I had the idea and I wrote the script and I was confident in the script, that was about nine rewrites in, I started reaching out to a lot of my friends that I've developed over the years, uh, managers, agents, and actors and just had them read the project. I didn't tell them I wanted anything from them. I just wanted their feedback. When they started responding back to the project, actors approached me and said, I really want to do this. Uh, one of them was a friend of mine who was doing a lot of television, who was, who was up for a lot of awards, and even this year, you know, they're toting his film as having an Oscar run. Um, hmm. He heard about the project. He called me. He said, I don't care what my agent says. He's, he's with a big agency. He says, I don't care what my manager says. This project is for me. So I said, okay, jump in the pool with me. I want to do a bunch of marketing stuff. I want to do a bunch of shoots. I want to do some small video stuff and eventually put together a mini up front. If you want to do this project, you know, put your money where your mouth is and, and, and get down with me. Mm-hmm. So he agreed to it. And together we started going out to a lot of uh, showrunners and directors who we have been tracking, who we knew were sort of favorable to um, to different television networks who were next up to have their shows, they responded right away to the material. But while we were going out to them, we were shooting promo material. Him and I, you know, I used all of the filmmaking skills that I had, all of the editing skills and all the favors that I had to shoot a lot of uh, promotional material and put together a package. So when we would sit down and go in these meetings, you know, I would hand people this package, and they're like, is this project already done? I'm like, no, this is a project I want to do. This is a project that, you know, we want to do, and this is just sort of what we feel about it. You know, this mm-hmm. is just, it's an art project that goes along with the project. People responded right away. Like, his manager, and he's with a really big manager, really big agent, they saw the material. They went nuts. They literally turned down features and other television shows and said, we want to focus on this because this is exactly what we had in our mind for our clients. Mm -hmm. Um, We approached a TV director who was also a TV producer who had done a bunch of pilot work, worked with, you know, every network under the sun, sat down with him, showed him the material. He came off of his, his vacation and said, I want to work with it. So um, fast, fast forwarding to about two weeks ago, we put together a mini upfront uh, where we were going to showcase both the art project that I had been shooting along with the actor and do a table read simultaneously, but in a very sleek and sexy way that encompasses both the world and my style, but can give the actors and the producers and all the individuals that we invited there just a comfortable feeling to kick back and, and hear this script. So we did that and it was a success. And we got a lot of interest off of our presentation. Um, The the visual uh, uh, representation of the project did magnificent. And uh, we hired a really big casting director to cast named actors, not just great actors, but named actors, people that had their own draw um, to, to participate in this. We got a lot of no's, but then we got a lot of big yeses. So when they came, you know, the agencies came out, the production companies came out, executives came out, the networks came out. Um, Mm -hmm. So it was a radical strategy. The entire time people have been telling us, this TV is not sold this way. TV, Mm -hmm. you know, is very regimented. You know, you have to go through your agent, your managers, and they have to submit to the right production company who has the deal and X, Y, and Z. But when we presented the material, when we told people what we were doing, they responded, they said, I would love to go to this as opposed to having to read, you know, a ton of scripts and provide feedback or, you know, mm-hmm. uh, going the traditional way. And they said, if you guys are successful, you guys may change the way TV is sold. 
So I'll yeah. just and that's kind of the obvious question is how do you approach – how do you get a list of producers to approach and what do you do? Do you email them? Does your agent email them? Do you cold call them? Yeah. How do you get these agents everybody to – Everybody has to – everybody has to work. All of the above. That's the short answer. All of the okay. above. We, we, we were meticulous about our list first and foremost. We looked and said, okay, this, is, this could never be on ABC – you know, it won't. It, it couldn't be on Nick at Night. It couldn't be on these certain, certain networks. But we still want to make sure that we have the buzz. So we re- leaned on a lot of our friendships. Um, once the agencies, um, both Ken uh, Winningham, who is my other producing partner, and Mo McRae, they're both really big agents. Ken um, is a huge television director. Once his people got a hold of the project, they made calls. Mo's uh, agent and managers made calls. My agent and managers made calls. And then we called our friends. Uh, then we strategically sent out the, the project, the script, and the package prior to sending out the invite um, so that people would have it and, you know, they would sort of forget about it. And then when we sent out the invite, people were like, hey, well, what is this? It, it forced them to pick up the, the, the script and read through it. Um, mm-hmm. We went after corporate uh, partnerships. We went after branding partnerships because it's a show and all of television or all of entertaining, entertainment is about selling. So we figured why not start early. Um, and once we got a lot of those partnerships, and Alejandro helped out a lot with that, once we got those partnerships, it really solidified the project as being real and tangible and people wanted to be a part of it. We made it fun and sexy and, you know, sophisticated and people want people love that you know we it gave them a, a breakup from their mundane lives mm-hmm. um so what's uh, the so what's the end game with some with a table read like this essentially you've brought in agents managers people from the studios you're hoping that after the table read one of them will basically say okay we want to buy this project and we want to go ahead and produce it absolutely absolutely that is the end game that 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 is the ultimate uh, uh, in game, and you know, I'm very transparent in that. Like, this is a sales pitch. It was a sales pitch, and it was a successful sales pitch because we are getting meetings from it. You know, so now it's just sort of strategizing where the business goes from there. Um, so, but for me, it was also about seeing if I can do something that I had in my head that I knew nobody else was doing. Like, I had no competition for this. The only other people that do, the only time an upfront is done. It's for a project that's already, you know, essentially been shot or the marketing marketing material has been professionally produced and it's being presented to the networks to see mm-hmm. what the next stage is. This was radical because none of that had been done. The only things that had been done was essentially a half year's worth of an art project where I got actors and, you know, uh, photographers and, and, and videographers and cinematographers to shoot things that were in my mind that were derivative of the world. So I just wanted to test my own metal and see if I can get it done, and I got it done. But I also wanted to see sort of what would happen if you went this way as opposed to going the traditional way. Um, Mm -hmm. I do have projects. Alejandro and I have other projects, television projects, feature films, that are being marketed and, you know, pushed the traditional way, which is essentially our agents submitting them, you know, us getting feedback, getting a room, you pitch. You wait on the feedback from there. You go back. Like I have projects like that because Driven is so close to me because I love this project so much. Like I literally, I want to do it more than anything. I just wanted to take a different approach to it, and mm-hmm. everybody told me not to, and I'm just a rebel. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, I, outside the box thinking. I mean, that's what it's all about, man. Is just getting out there and doing stuff. And if nobody else is doing it, as you say, that actually adds to the sort of the lure of it and the the luster of it. So, yeah, and, and I, that's um, a bunch of that these folks now know his name, and anything else. You know, we do have other projects, though. Even if somebody doesn't end up. Uh, Pick it up, driven. They'll remember his name, and, and when our next pilot goes out or Bible goes out, they're going to be like, "Oh yeah, these are the guys that know how to throw a nice little party." <laughs> mm-hmm. I'm going to read this because last time I, I gave them a chance, they impressed me. So even if you don't like like the festivals, like the contest, even if you don't get a direct win, you still win. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah, yeah, for sure. Well, you guys have both been very generous with your time. This has been a great interview. As I said, I think we could go on for hours. Um, what, what's the best way for people to contact you? And, and, you know, maybe if you want to give an email, give an email or your Twitter account or blog, anything you want to do. Johnny, why don't you go first and just um, tell us how people can, can keep up with what you're doing and, and potentially ask you a question if they have any. Oh, absolutely. Well, I'm on the face. I'm on Facebook, obviously. I'm on Instagram at Johnny J O H N N Y under underscore Silver S I L V E R. Okay. Um, on Facebook, it's uh, Johnny Silver or Johnny T Silver, um, or Johnny the Director. You can look up any of those things. Um, I'll leave my uh, I'll leave my email address with you. So if anybody wants to. Uh, contact me or ask me a question. I'm I'm open to all questions. Um, and then, uh, yeah, that's the best way to, to contact me. Perfect, perfect. Alejandro, how about yourself? And, and for me, I think the best way is through my uh, work email, um, since that's something I'm on all day long, every day, uh, which is my last name, Seri, S as in Sam, E-R-I, at finaldraft.com. And, and if you want to ask a technical question, I, I'll probably answer that too. <laughs> perfect, perfect. Yeah, I'll, I'll I'll link all this stuff in the show notes. Um, I, just so so people don't have to write it down, they can just click over from the show notes, and I'll link to your um, Facebook page and Instagram page, Johnny, and then I'll, I'll I'll put your email address in there, Alejandra. So well, once again, guys, you've been really generous. This has been a very enlightening episode. I mean, it's got me thinking about um, some potentially marketing materials that I should be doing for my own script. So I really appreciate you guys coming on the show. Let, let me know when you're ready to create those. <laughs> that, you know, I had I wrote down that as we were talking. I wrote down the question: What does, um, if you don't mind sharing that, how much does it cost um, to to create the marketing materials for for a script, a feature script? It, there is just to give no, us a, even just a ballpark range would would probably be helpful. Okay, so I'll, I it, it depends. It depends on the project. It depends on what assets have to be created. But I say uh, budget to spend between twenty five hundred and twenty five hundred and five thousand. But five thousand is more on if you start to want to get uh, other things like business plans and and uh, getting your script broke down and scheduled and things like that. Like budgeting things, those tend to be a little bit more expensive. If you're looking at just creating marketing material to sort of att- attract a big fish that will do that stuff anyway. Uh, it, it, it it's not as expensive as it sounds. I take it on a case by case basis. I turn mm-hmm. a lot of work down, but I also take a lot of work and I do a lot of charity as well. And if I can't facilitate you, I can direct you to individuals who can facilitate you. So, sure, sure. You know, me do you have a from, website? Do you have a website where you where your business is? Maybe we could link to that. It's in the process. Okay, <laughs> it's, perfect, perfect. It's in the process. I've been busy writing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, well, when you get that settled, email email that to me, and I'll put it in the show notes for people that listen to this podcast You know, months down the road. So once again, guys, this has been very informative. I really appreciate you guys coming on the show. Oh, thank, so thank you, you Ashley. Me. I'm going to be running another online class called Before You Begin to Write Your Screenplay. I'm going to be discussing the various steps that you should be taking before you begin to actually write your screenplay. I'll be showing you the exact process that I use. I see too many screenwriters who begin writing before they're ready and what happens is they end up with a screenplay chock full of problems and once that first draft is written it becomes very difficult to fix problems that could have been easily fixed in the outlining stage. This class is the second one in the series of classes that I'm doing that will guide you through the entire screenwriting process from coming up with a marketable concept to outlining and writing your screenplay to marketing your screenplay to agents and producers. If you missed the first class, that's not a problem. I record it and have put it into the SYS Select forum for you to listen to at your leisure. This class is going to be on Saturday, October 18th at 10 a.m. Pacific time. If you'd like to learn more about this class, go to www.sellingyourscreenplay.com slash classes. If you're listening to this after October 18th, that's not a problem. I will record this class as well, and I will put it in the SYS Select Library. To learn how you can get all of those classes, just go to www.sellingyourscreenplayselect.com. In the next episode of the Selling Your Screenplay podcast, I'm going to be interviewing Danny Bramson, who was a producer on the recent film Jimmy All Is By My Side. So keep an eye out for that episode next week. To wrap things up, I just want to touch on a few things from today's interview with Alejandra and Johnny. Obviously, there's a ton of valuable information in this interview. If you didn't get some value out of it, you're just listening to the wrong podcast. 
the main thing that stands out to me and forget about all the logistics and specifics of what they're doing. That's all great stuff. And you should definitely listen to that. But the main thing that stands out to me is just how hard these guys are working. These guys are super smart. They're working incredibly hard and they're hungry. And I believe this is the sort of effort that it takes to succeed in this business. Really listen to what's going on with these guys and understand that's the sort of effort and dedication it takes. You're competing with guys like this for the precious, precious few screenwriting jobs that are out there. So if you're not willing to put forth this sort of effort, what chance do you really have? Anyway, that's the show. Thanks for listening.